we have the winner for Achievement in Film Editing for Dunkirk, Lee Smith. I'll start with 261 right here and then go to 92. Thank you. Lee. Why, thank you. Um, Angela on Bishop right. from Network 10 Australia on your right over here. Oh, hi. G'day. How are you? Congratulations. How thank awesome. You. Very awesome. Thank you. Um, I'd love to know, do you credit learning your skills in the Australian film industry for getting this little gold statue today in any way? Yes, I'd have to totally credit that. Uh, you know, all of my formulative years were in the Australian film industry and working with the greats like Peter Weir and Phil Noyce and Jane Campion and, you know, many other great directors, obviously George Miller. Um, so, yeah, I mean, to get here is the sum of all those parts. And then, of course, falling in with Christopher Nolan, who is a complete and utter genius. And why he works with me, I've got no idea. But uh, it's awesome. And how do you plan to go? Uh, I've got a couple of parties to go to. And uh, apparently this gets me into one. And uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm going to... I mean, this has been very tense up until this particular moment. So I'm feeling so much better. <laughs> We're going to 92 and then 59. Carolyn Giardino from The Hollywood Reporter. Hi, Lee. Hey, how are you, Congratulations. Carolyn. Thank you. Um, this is your seventh film, I believe, with Chris Nolan. What has made that collaboration successful and also the collaboration with his longtime sound team, which also went tonight? I think, uh, you know, if, if you have similar tastes to the people you work with, you tend to work with them on many, many films. And... Uh, you know, I'm pleased that when I first started working with Chris, you know, we were always looking at things in a similar light. And, you know, some people say a combative relationship, you know, does wonders for films. But in my experience, it's the complete reverse, is that if you're looking at things and you're liking them and you're hearing music and you're feeling the same emotion, then, you know, you're in sync with each other. So that, you know rolls over into many, many films of collaboration. And, of course, there becomes a shorthand working with people who you've worked with and the teams you work with. Going to 59 and then 125. Hi, I'm Matt Fagerholm, RogerHebert.com. I'd love to know, is there, was there a similarity in your approach to juxtaposing the different timelines, you know, things happening over a different space and time in this film with juxtaposing the different dream worlds in Inception? It seemed like there was a similarity in, in approach there. Was there? <laughs> uh, the only similarity, I think, is just trying to make sense of, of the very complicated story you're trying to tell. And I think my job as an editor is to, you know, do your best to keep the audience with you uh, and, you know, let them stay with you over the course of any given movie and entertain them. I mean... It's got to be entertaining, and these, you know, you've just picked on two very, very complicated movies. Uh, the similarities are Chris does love to play with multiple timelines and dream within a dream within a dream, and I might be in a dream now. I'm not sure. I feel like I'm in a dream. Uh, but, yeah, it's, it's um, I think the editor's job is to just simply keep the audience entertained, keep them understanding the plot, keep it moving forward, and then hopefully you come out of it with a commercial success. And all of Chris's films have been, and, and uh, no small amount of credit goes to him. We're going to 125 and then 101. Hi, Lee. It's Jazz from Awards Daily. Congratulations. Thank you. Can you talk a little bit, a little bit about the emotional, um, the climatic sequence with the little ships and ensuring maximum... Um, emotional impact at that moment? Well, that was a very interesting scene. It was one of the few scenes that we slid in the timeline uh, as we were editing and testing the film because we were setting up this continuous suspense, you know, breathlessness to the film. And what I was always worried about is someone would actually pass out watching the movie. So we had this emotional uh, cannon to fire and we had to find the exactly the right moment to fire that cannon. And we tried it earlier, later in the timeline. And it took many, many uh, versions of the film until we actually hit what affected, I guess, Chris and I the most from an emotional standpoint. And that's where it sits in the film now. 
We'll go to 101 and we'll wrap it up with 227. Hi. Uh, <laughs> oh, hi. Hi. Congratulations. Thank um, you. Uh, Carolyn Visoke from Warner Brothers. I was wondering if you could uh, talk about perhaps if this was a challenge or not with the decision to not show the enemy forces throughout the film. Uh, I think that was a, a decision made very early on uh, from Chris where if you wanted to experience this war, you wouldn't want to have the ability to jump to the enemy's uh, viewpoint. Uh, which is this sort of, you know, in, in most war films, you would jump to the German position and read some subtitles or jump to the Germans who are sniping on the boat and see them taking aim and, and try and get into their headspace. I think what Chris was really trying for is the ability to just stay with the, uh, the, the characters that we were on. So you're never jumping forward or backward. And uh, we did a similar thing in Master and Commander, so I was used to that as an idea where we were staying in that film on the English boats versus the French boat. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a constricting way of making a film, but I think it's a very real way of making a film. And uh, I think it worked out really well, and I think it was the right decision. I mean, in the end, you see a couple of German helmets, and that is the entire enemy force from our point of view, the audience. And we'll wrap it up down here with Jeannie. Jeannie Wolf, the Sound Evening Post. The sound of this, of this movie is very much part of the momentum. I want to know how much the music, the score played into that. I mean, Hans Zimmer said this is the toughest thing he, he ever has done. And I wondered, is it music? Is it sound effects? And how much did that influence how you created the momentum? Well, the, the momentum in the film was designed by Chris right from the get-go. When I first arrived in Dunkirk, where we started shooting, he put a pair of headphones on me and played me the sound of a watch ticking, but with a very interesting cadence. And that cadence is uh, it's, it's something that just always sounds like it's ascending. And it's always make, so it's making your heart beat faster and faster. And no matter where you cut, you can make this ascension forever. And that's what we did with the music. So no matter where you drop into the track, if you just drop in and listen, it sounds like it's ascending. It's an audio illusion that was very, very complicated. And one of the reasons that Alex Gibson was put on the ticket with the uh, sound effects supervisor, Richard King, because the complexity of what that was was you could never put a cut in the music. So once we... Once we laid the music in, whenever I changed the picture, we had to move the edit points on the music in a very unconventional fashion. I know I'm talking on and on, but it's so complicated, I'm surprised Hans could even stand up and talk about it because it, it really was a, a, a mathematical and technical marvel. And it has a lot to do with why your heart races in the movie from the get-go. It's, it's ascension. It's, it's continually sounding like it's getting worse. And then we briefly pause it when we're on the beach and then we reinstigate it again. And then, yeah, it's, it is one of the most unique scores, I think, in, in history. And it worked. Wow. Yeah, uh, I thought it worked. And it was, it was amazing. Uh, it was an amazing uh, challenge to work on. But, uh, you know, good things come of uh, hard work, so... <laughs> Thank you so much and congratulations. Thank you, Thank you very much.